Matthew 7 and the single verse tonight that we will treat, God willing, is verse number 12. And this is known by the common name, the golden rule. It says this, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Let's read that again. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. The message tonight really is this, that doing to others, as it says here, is the same thing as loving your neighbor as yourself. It's the same thing as loving your neighbor as yourself. Let me justify that statement. The phrase that keyed me into this notion is at the end where it says, this is the law and the prophets. And you might remember that there are other verses in the New Testament that give us a summary of the law and the prophets. Are you thinking of some of them now from your Bible reading? The law and the prophets. Think of Matthew 22, 37 to 40, when the Lord is asked, what is the great commandment in the law? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, right, soul, mind, your strength. And this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang what? All the law and the prophets. There's that phrase. So the Lord connects this idea of love and for, for love for God and love for neighbor as a summation of or a gathering up of the law and the prophets. Think of Romans uh, 13 and verse number 8. 13 and verse number 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled what? The law. Romans 13, 10, love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. We're, we're chasing down this idea of the law and the prophets and seeing that in the New Testament we have this idea of love connected with the summation of the law and the prophets, and we have the law and the prophets here summed up in the idea of whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Galatians 5.14 says this, For the law, all the law, is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Or James chapter 2 and verse number 8, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. So notice that in all these verses, the attribute of love drives conduct that by its nature fulfills the law of God toward others. If you love someone, you will not break the Ten Commandments toward them. So if you love God, you won't take his name in vain, you won't make other gods, you won't worship other gods before him, and so on, according to the first four of the Ten Commandments. And if you love your neighbor as yourself, you won't, you know, steal and covet and murder and uh, commit adultery and not honor your parents and all of those things in the second part of the law, the second table as it were, uh, you will love God. Then you will not break the Ten Commandments toward Him, nor will you break them towards uh, your fellow man. If you love God, that will guide you to do right toward the Lord. And so from this, I draw the conclusion that love is connected to the measuring stick, which the Lord says this way, whatever you want men to do to you, okay, picture that as a measuring stick, whatever you want men to do to you, you measure your conduct by that measuring stick, and that measuring stick is also known by the name love, love towards your neighbor. If you measure your own behavior by that measuring stick of love, then and if you find that your behavior matches, then you are following the Lord's command here in verse 12. If you do to others as you would have them do to you, then you are loving them at least as well as you're loving yourself, right? No man yet ever hated himself, his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. And so, uh, husbands, to love your wives as Christ loved the church, love as you love yourself at least 
Okay, and that will be doing this. Now, verse 12 is often uh, taken. Most commonly, it's used out of context. <laughs> out of context. That's how it's most commonly used. It is lifted from the context and preached as merely the so-called golden rule, and it becomes a moralism, which by itself is often portrayed as a good work that we need to do if we are to please God and achieve a good standing before Him. So in churches that don't preach the gospel, that is, the gospel of faith in Christ, they just preach a moralistic message. This is a hot topic for them. Okay? They preach this good work that we have to do this to please God, you know, just love one another, uh, do good to one another as you would have people do to you, and that's kind of the metric for good conduct and having a fine life. As long as we have done more of, more of that, then we have pleasing ourselves, they think, we will be fine and God will be fine with us. And that's just another fancy way of saying that your good works outweigh your bad works, you think, and you'll be fine. But there's a lot missing from this analysis. How is it that you get to the point of doing and in fact desiring to do to others as you would have them do to you? How does such selflessness come about? How, where does that come from? This magical ability to work up in yourself a level of selflessness where you will live this way. How do you beat back the sin nature so that you will serve others as you would have them serve you? Only after exercising repentant faith in Christ will you be able to carry, such, carry out such a high calling. You cannot just tell people, look, do to others as you would have them do to you in isolation from the context. What's the context? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, therefore, Matthew chapter 3, 2, Matthew 4, 17, and you need to have your righteousness look better than the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You need to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. You need to fulfill the law of God, the real intention of the law of God. Remember, we looked at that in Matthew chapter 5. It wasn't just mere externals. It was real internals. Nevertheless, even though it's often taken out of context, doing to others as love would direct is required of all people, and especially believers in Christ. By this, your conduct will be pleasing to God. Now, non-believers are also called to this standard of conduct, but, you know, by the way, they're called to all of those standards of conduct conduct in God's moral law, but they find it impossible to carry it out properly, or they find it difficult to understand, or the unbeliever, excuse me, applies the wrong standard because they have not received the revealed will of God in Scripture to modify their own ideas of what is right and wrong. So when you say to somebody, do unto others as you would have them do to you, if they don't have their consciences informed by the Bible, they sit there and they think, well, let's see, what would I like people to do to me? Uh, and it could be sinful things or uh, wrong things. And so, okay, I'll, I'll do that to them as well. So you have this kind of warped view of what you should ha want for yourself, and that causes you then to have a warped view of what you should then give to others in, in life. Um, I'll mention maybe an example or two of that in a moment. So we have looked at the relating this to other verses that, that connect to the Law and the Prophets, shown that love really is the same idea as doing to others as you would have them do to you. We've cautioned ourselves about taking the verse out of context. And then I want to spend some time thinking about the teaching in general. Stop to think about this in your own life. Think about it generically, first of all as regards to your conduct with people in general? Are you conducting yourself in a way, perhaps the Lord is bringing to mind a certain individual or certain people in your life where you can say, yes, I am doing to them as I would have them do to me. And I think you can see quite well whether or not your conduct matches to this metric. This, remember, measuring stick called love. 
uh, you're doing to them differently than what you would have them do to you. That inconsistency is the mark of a problem. Then plug in some names and see how it sounds with where it says, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, people, it's obviously talking about men as people, generic. Instead of you, plug in I. Whatever I want people to do to me, do also to fill in the blank, person X. Who is person X in your life, in your mind? Take that and put person X in there instead of generic men or people. Put you in there, yourself, I, instead of the word you. This will help you to see if you're exhibiting the love of God and therefore fulfilling the law and the prophets toward those people. Now, we're thinking about this. What else can we think about it? Well, think about what you like and don't like. Think about what you want and don't want. Think about what you value and don't value. Think about how you like to be treated and how you don't like to be treated. Think about how you like kind things said about you and about how you like easy to get along with people instead of difficult people. Think about how you like friendly people. Then think about being that way yourself, the kind of way that you want people to be toward you. You don't like to deal with difficult people, right? So don't be difficult. You don't like to deal with people who are unkind, so don't be unkind. People who are short-tempered or people who value totally different things than you do. Well, don't value those, you know, obviously if there's wrong things, you can't value those things, but recognize that other people have the same kinds of likes and values and dislikes that you have. Apply that to how you treat others and start doing that right now. If you need to, you might need to repent and tell somebody, I haven't been doing like the Lord teaches here. And I know that's wrong as a believer. You know, even if they do not reciprocate right now, or they don't start reciprocating soon, or they don't start, they don't reciprocate to you ever, do what is right anyway. Okay? Two jerks don't make a nice person. <laughs> you know? You be nice. You be loving toward them. If they're going to be a jerk, let them be a jerk. You know, we don't start with, person X treated me in such and such a bad way, so I'm going to return the favor. That's vengeance. No, we start by considering how we would like to be treated and then act that way. Notice what it says. Whatever you want people to do to you, do also to them. Don't think about the bad stuff that they've done and then do likewise to them. It's you start with this metric. What do you desire? What do you want? What, do you, what is nice to you? What do you love to happen to yourself and you do that to other people? Our behavior then becomes standardized by God's teaching instead of being justified or guided by our sinful behavior or the sinful behavior of others. In other words, you don't look at the standard of that person over there. Okay, I know I used the word jerk, but let's say they were a jerk to me. Don't start with that conduct and let that guide you. Start with the conduct that you know would be right and would be pleasing and let that guide you. And by the way, on this idea of fulfilling the law and the prophets, the Lord Jesus did come to fulfill the law and the prophets, didn't he? 517 says that, remember? Chapter 5 and verse number 17 says... Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, I think when we read this, we probably think fulfill means he's come to bring about the predictions of the Old Testament, right? But when you read it in the light of this in chapter 7 about... This is the law and the prophets. How do you fulfill the law and the prophets? 
by loving your neighbor and loving your God. That's how you fulfill the law and the prophets. That's what they all are. So this, when it says he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, I, I think we need to ponder, does this mean that he came just to fulfill the predictions? But what about the entirety of God's instruction in the law and the prophets? The Lord came to fulfill all of that. This passage's connection to love as the fulfillment of the law makes me wonder if perhaps we've misunderstood fulfill before in our reading. Christ came to love God perfectly and to love fe fellow human beings perfectly. That is what fulfills the law, not just, not only filling the predictions, you know, that there would be a king that would arise and there'd be a prophet and there'd be a priest and there'd be a guy who would take the sins of the world and he would die and be resurrected and all of those things, not just the happenings of prophesied events from years gone by, but the fulfillment of the law in terms of love. He came to fulfill that. That's quite a powerful insight, I think, to our Lord's mission and ministry. Now also, as we ponder this, let's remember, we're not to mechanically apply these verses or these rules, if you will, just like we were to remember, you know, to look at the heart of the law in Matthew chapter 5. It wasn't just mere external obedience like, don't rob banks. That's easy. You know, don't want to rob banks. Don't want the money in the bank. You know, don't want to increase your lifestyle by, by greed, the, the Lord would say. Now, I know he didn't use that example, but he talked about, you know, adultery, and he talked about anger leading to murder and all of those things. The heart of the law. Mere external compliance doesn't cut it. The real spirit or intention of the law is this. Love your neighbor. So we don't help our neighbor because, well, I have to. I'm supposed to. We love our neighbor because we think that is what I would like to have done for me, and that would please my neighbor, and that would be a real help to my neighbor, and that would prevent him from some further loss, and that's what we, what we should do, and that's what I want to do. It's not I have to. It's no, this is the right thing to do. This is how we love our neighbor, this is what I would like done for me. Now, um, I think one other big kind of thought here, and that is, how does this connect to the previous text? You look at the beginning of the verse again, carefully, look at that, verse 12, therefore, therefore. How does that connect? I mean, he's talking about uh, judgment in verses 7, 1 through 5, and it, holy pearls and swine and dogs in verse uh, 6, and then about asking, seeking, knocking, you know, asking in prayer, asking God for things. Uh, gives the example of a son who asked for bread or fish, the father who gives him a good, uh, good gift or a good, uh, you know, response to that, and God being even better than us evil people and, and asking and, or giving in, in, in response to our asking. And therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. What's the connection? The illustration of a child use, uh, asking for bread or fish and receiving a stone or a serpent is that immediate context. It illustrated that even evil people give good things to their children because they love them and they want them to be well provided for. God is far better than evil people and will most certainly give his children what is good and necessary for them. Since God is love and this is manifested in that he gives good things to those who ask, Therefore, if you're a repentant person, a person who wishes to be, you know, just like your Father in heaven is perfect, a person with more righteousness than the scribes and the Pharisees, then you will do to others what you would like them to do to you. In other words, you will act in love toward them because you would like them to act in love toward you. So this is the connection here we're getting at. Now, somebody might be contrarian and saying, well, I want people to do bad things to me. That's just foolish nonsense, but I've heard that kind of thing, you know, so I'll do bad things to them. That's fine if they do it to me. I, you know, I like to harm people. And I'm fine if they do it to me. I know that's just how life goes. Uh, it's going to catch up to me eventually, but I'm going to do it as much as I can until it does catch up to me. That's evil and warped thinking, if not demon-possessed thinking. The law and the prophet equivalent to the law of love does good to others. 
When someone asks of you, you will try to give. When someone seeks, you will try to help them find. When someone knocks, you will try to help them open the door. You start seeing the connection to what we looked at before. Ask, seek, knock. Okay. God may just be using you as the way to answer the prayer that the person had. He's asking, seeking, knocking to God, and God taps you over here and says, hey, help that person by answering, by helping them find, by opening the door for them. You see that? You're, you're being used by God to help answer the prayers of another person. Now, one commentator, uh, Lloyd-Jones, that I've been reading, suggests that the therefore goes all the way back to judgment in, in verses 1 through 5, and that there's a direct connection uh, with verse 6 and the asking of 7 to 11. I, I think that's all a little bit too specific to, to me. But the teaching on asking and here on doing to others is more general than that. So it's not just specifically asking about judgment or uh, doing, to ju doing judgment to others as you would have them do to you, although that's true. You know, how you want people to judge you? Well, you want them to judge you with mercy? Well, then judge others with mercy. So there is a, a kind of connection there. Uh, if you don't want people to be super critical of you, then don't be that way toward others. So this includes being like God uh, toward us and, and our actions toward others. God treats us very well in giving good gifts. We don't deserve those, but God gives them anyway, and we should be that way to other people. I'm brought to the thought that, as well here, that doing to others as you would have done to you by them does not always mean that there will be an immediate reciprocation between you and person X. It may be that you learn this virtue and practice it towards some hard person X in your life, and God will arrange that some other person Y will do to you as you would have had X do to you, right? So you're working on this relationship with person X and how you conduct yourself toward them, and you may never get anything back in return or much, but maybe God will return it to you through other channels, through other, through other means. I think we see that happen in our lives sometimes. But even if no person Y comes along, we're still enjoined to live toward that difficult person, X, as we would wish X would live toward us. So in conclusion tonight, as we think about this golden rule, I want you to think not just about pondering the verse or commenting on the verse or connecting the verse to other verses like we did at the beginning. Rather, the Lord wants us to obey the verse. Not just talk about it, not just think about it, not just ponder it, not just comment on it, not just connect it and do our little Bible study and, and all of that, but put into practice this principle. We do not obey sometimes because we are sinners, but we do not obey to our own hurt. Others do not follow this teaching because they too are sinners. We do not do to others as we would have them do to us because we think about our own things. We think about ourselves. We do not stop to think about others. Have you ever found that to be the case? You're just not thinking about other people. You're thinking about one person, me. Further, we do not put God first. We have to love God with all of our hearts, and then we can love our neighbors properly. But if we put ourselves first, God will probably come last, and others will come last. We have to put God first, and then others will come along in the right order, and then ourselves, we will be last. Finally, I wonder this, to close. Do you think that we should treat God as we would like Him to treat us? Just a thought. How do we treat God? Maybe that would be a helpful thought. Maybe you've never thought of it before. Whatever you want God to do to you, do that also to him. I think the verse is general enough that in principle, you know, you can say that. I mean, think about the inconsistency. God, I want all the goodies, but I don't really want to live for you too much. I mean, 
you know, be too active in the church or give myself to you or um, be in the Word of God or spend any time in prayer. But yeah, but God, whenever I ask, I want you to be there right ready for me. Answer right away. What, what is that? That's just self, isn't it? So I encourage you to think about that little possible application. Maybe that will help us to live toward others as we would like to be lived towards ourselves. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the golden rule. Thank you for the time I was able to spend the last couple of days studying it and thinking with uh, the word about what to do and how to behave. And I pray that you would help me to improve my own life in this regard and each of those that are hearing tonight, whether here or on the computer, Lord, touch us, convict us, I pray, with this material. In Jesus' name, amen.